Hi, and welcome to Fairview Range Focus. I'm David Hall, Senior Vice President with Fairview Range. It's a pleasure to welcome you here today. Thanks for watching. Uh, I'm joined today by Dr. Paul uh, Denoncourt. Uh, he's a new orthopedic surgeon that has just joined Fairview Range. And so I look forward to visiting with you and learning more about uh, your background and what you're bringing to Fairview Range. But I, I know you're new to, to the area, so maybe we could just start, if you would, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your background and what brought you to uh, northern Minnesota. Sure. Um, I was born, raised, and educated in Massachusetts and uh, did my orthopedic uh, training in the Boston area and then went into private practice on the coast of Maine. Hmm. Initially I um, started a practice so I was alone for a while and then built the practice up to four practitioners. I was there for 28 years okay. and uh, um, just left recently. The uh, weather in New England is a lot like the weather you're having here except now they're getting more snow than a you. A lot, yes. Um, I, uh, and apparently you've had the mildest January on record, so I'm telling my patients, I don't know what you Minnesotans are complaining about. <laughs> this, is, this is a piece of cake this huh. winter. Um, but uh, I was back in Boston this past weekend, and the snow amounts there are impressive, so I'm hoping that we get some here. Okay. We like, my wife and I like to cross-country ski and uh, uh, snowshoe, ice skate, so we're looking forward to doing those activities here. Mm -hmm. Well, moving from Maine to here really isn't that much of a transition than from a weather standpoint. And uh, I mean, because we offer a lot of those same kinds of things and, and uh, have similar weather. But as you said, it's been a really a unique winter uh, for us this year compared to the past. So, yes. all right, very good. And where we were on the coast of Maine looks a lot like the coast of the North Shore. Oh. So it uh, feels like home when I drive along the North Shore and see those granite cliffs jutting out against the, the okay. water. And so you, you're uh, part of the Fairview Masaba Clinic. I am. And so you're seeing patients there. Yes, I started about three weeks ago. Okay, okay. So beginning uh, seeing patients on a regular basis and uh, providing uh, surgical services and um, at the hospital. Yes, I'm full time at the hospital, and uh, I've already started doing surgery, and my surgery schedule is starting to fill up. My clinic schedule is filling up quickly. Okay. So the. It's apparent that the need for an orthopedist is great here. It is. And that's one of the things that attracted us to this area, um, that and the cold weather. And uh, the Minnesota nice. It was apparent when we came here to interview that uh, people are a lot nicer here than back east. Well, well that's, so, uh, that's good to hear, I think. <laughs> that, uh, that attracted us. Yeah. Um, another thing is my, my wife could uh, also find work here. Um, she's also employed by Fairview Range. So. Mm -hmm. um, we were glad to find a hospital that needed both of us. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Well, I think uh, your point regarding orthopedic care, and I mean, I mean, I think one thing I've really learned over the years that I've been here, people like to stay home, uh, as close to home as they can when it comes to health care. So uh, the orthopedic needs has been a difficult for a challenge, I think, over the years. So I think it'll be a welcome addition to uh, the community in the area to have orthopedic care, you know, right here in the community. As so, I see it, will probably need to expand and recruit other orthopedists as well because yeah. the need is so great that one person can't handle it all. I'm sure, right, okay. Maybe you could talk a little bit about orthopedic um, care from this standpoint. I mean, probably um, not everyone is as familiar um, as far as what kinds of services um, that orthopedics uh, mm -hmm. are offered and what kinds of things that you do. Maybe you could just speak to that a little bit. Orthopedic surgery is the medical and surgical treatment of the musculoskeletal system. So that means we treat conditions and injuries of muscles, tendons, ligaments, bones, and joints. So the bread and butter of my practice is treating fractures, broken bones, um, also uh, arthritis of joints. Uh, my forte is hip and knee replacements. Mm. And I had a very busy joint replacement practice back in Maine. One third of my surgeries were joint replacements back there. Okay. So um, I plan on uh, being a general orthopedist with a forte in hip and knee replacements. Uh, that being said, that uh, we, we will see uh, most orthopedic things, but I also know that uh, that I and this hospital have some limits, and uh, that which we cannot take care, we'll make arrangements to have done at the university or at Duluth where, the, where there are some, some specialists. Okay. 
How about um, uh, athletic-wise? I mean, I know that there's um, uh, individuals who, from uh, sports injuries, that can have issues with rotator cuffs and uh, torn cartilage and things of that nature. Is that also something that you treat? Yes, yes, I do. Uh, I was blessed with the um, fact that the chairman of my orthopedic department, the University of Massachusetts, was also one of the um, co-owners of the Boston Red Sox. Oh. So uh, he was the medical director for the, the, the organization, and we took care of the Red Sox players. So I've had the, uh, the, the great joy of admitting ball players and, and, and assisting with surgery on them and helping to put them back together and get them back on the, on the field. But baseball isn't the only um, experience I have. Uh, I personally have been a long distance runner for quite a while. I've run several marathons, including the Boston Marathon twice. Oh, wow. And so I'm also interested in long distance running and, and other endurance sports. So we, my, my program had a heavy uh, bent towards sports medicine okay. where I trained. Okay. So that's something that you would welcome as well. In, uh, young individuals uh, may, might have a sports injury or... Um, Older individuals have sports injuries too. <laughs> okay, probably true. more often. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You also mentioned uh, arthritis. I, I'm fascinated by that because um, common. I mean, as we get older, uh, that uh, you know, arthritis can be uh, something that we uh, all can deal with or suffer from. Uh, is that what kind of treatment um, is that that you offer in regards to arth arthritis? Well, we offer both surgical and non-surgical treatment of arthritis. Uh, usually. <clears throat> The treatment of arthritis is like ascending a staircase. Uh, the first treatment, which most patients have already done before they come to see me, is to try over-the-counter medications like Advil or Aleve. Mm -hmm. And then when they come and see me and those are, haven't worked, we try prescription arthritis medication. And if that doesn't work, we consider medications that are injected into the knee. We all, then the next step, we think about braces and uh, physical therapy. And the last step is surgery. As far as surgery goes, there are uh, different things to offer, uh, but uh, the most famous, of course, is, is joint replacement. And uh, so in a total joint replacement, you replace both sides of a joint. So in a hip, for example, you replace both the ball and the socket. On a knee, you would replace the end of the thigh bone, top of the lower leg, and the back side of the kneecap. And as the technology is improving over the years, so are the outcomes with joint replacement and people are able to accomplish more and more. It used to be that you had to be retired and, and uh, not very active to have a joint replacement but nowadays we're able to put them in younger people and have them uh, uh, still remain fairly active. We don't recommend impact sports although some patients do go back and do that against mm -hmm. medical advice <coughs> but the uh, the the limit of being 65 to get a joint replacement is gone. People are doing joint replacements now in people in their 50s and they're forced to in their 40s. Mm. Try not to though. One thing to keep in mind is that the man-made joints don't last as long as the original joints. Uh, they will wear out mm. and when a man-made joint wears out and has to be revised, that's a much more complicated surgery that has a poorer outcome and, and a higher complication rate. So we like to have people get just one joint replacement for their life and uh, the longer they can make it with their regular joint, as long as they're not suffering or affecting quality of life, the better. What, what would you say you typically see with regards to, to the, the length or term of what you, after a joint replacement that one might you know, continue without before it, it needs revision? Well, <clears throat> when joint replacement first came out in the 60s, 70s, the lifespan of the implants was about 10 years and they started wearing out then. And what wore out was the plastic liner. Um, in, the, in the hip, the plastic liner lines the socket component. In the knee, it's between the, the end of the thigh bone, top of the lower leg bone. And the plastic was wearing out. As the plastic wears out, it works its way between the metal implant and the bone, causing, causing loosening of the, the implant, requiring revision of the whole thing. So they went back and re-engineered the plastic. And we're now using a, a second generation of plastic. And We've been using it since, for about the last 12 years or so. And so far, they're holding up. So they beat the 10-year record of the first generation implants. Mm -hmm. But frankly, <coughs> we, don't, we haven't used them long enough to find out how long they're going to last. So when patients ask me, I have to give them a cop-out answer and say, we don't know. But my gut tells me that if we get into 20 year, uh, 12 years with 
uh, implants doing fairly well. I think it's pretty safe to think that it's going to be about 20, and maybe even longer, but only time will tell. Okay. Interesting. Um, what about ages? Um, from the standpoint of patients that you might see, is there a particular age range that that you um, uh, is, or primarily see, or is there an age limit in regards to you don't see you know, young children or uh, certain age <coughs> categories in that regard? I basically see all ages. Okay. Uh, the very, very young um, would require, if they needed surgery, would require it in a, a, a place where they do pediatric surgery. Okay. So we might have to refer those. Um, congenital anomalies as well. Um, they just, we just don't see enough of those to remain uh, good at those, so we'd mm -hmm. have to send those off. But most of what I see children <coughs> for are broken bones, and we can handle most of, most of what they break. Um, I do limit my practice to uh, arms and legs, so I, I don't do any spine surgery or mm -hmm. spine work. Uh, and uh, spine, as a subset of orthopedics, is uh, a, 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 a very hot subspecialty right now. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, um, Surgery on the spine is so fine and so meticulous that you really want somebody who does a lot of them and is really good at it to mm -hmm. operate on your back. So, mm -hmm. so I, I don't do spine work, but arms and legs, almost womb to tomb. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, and I know you've done some cases um, at the Fairview Range Hospital. Um, how have you found the, the surgical facilities, and uh, has that been up to your expectations? The Major yes. Needs. Yes. It's uh, it's a great facility, and the staff is wonderful. They've been bent over backwards to accommodate me. Uh, when an old-time surgeon like me comes into town, you know, I've done things my way for 28 years, and it's hard to change. So, I ask them to adapt, and they've been very willing to do so. And the hospital's been willing to get the equipment I need, and because uh, uh, they really want to make this work, uh, they want orthopedics to be here in Hibbing for the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. So. That's my, my goal is to build an orthopedic practice here with a total joint program uh, in, encased inside it, get it up to the number of orthopedists we need, however that may be, to offer full-time orthopedic services mm -hmm. here. Okay. And as I understand, as you commented earlier, there is some effort going on to recruit additional or to partners that work with you or other? Yes, I have a physician assistant that we've already hired who will be starting at the end of this month. And we've begun the recruitment process for a second orthopedist. It takes quite a while to recruit someone. So uh, we have uh, a candidate who we're very interested in. He's very interested in us. And uh, we're, in the, we're about ready to set up a site visit so he can come visit us and we check him out and, and uh, see if it'll be a right fit. Good. If it works, uh, he could be here as early as the fall of this, of this year. Okay, excellent. Well, that would be a, a great addition. Um, I'd be curious I mean, if you could describe for us um, if an individual came to see you at the clinic you know, that maybe had a bone uh, fracture that needed surgical repair, what's the process from a timing standpoint and, you know, were they, um, they, I mean, is that they typically do come see you in the clinic first? Um, how does that typically work? Well, most of the fractures have come through the emergency room. Okay. So um, the emergency room has seen it, identified it, splinted it. If it's um, severe and needs emergent care, they would have called me. But uh, um, assuming they splinted it and referred it to the office, I try to get it in within, within a matter of days and assess the fracture and make a treatment plan. If uh, it needs surgery, uh, we, want, we have certain windows of time to uh, successfully execute the surgeries for fractures, so we get them in uh, within that window. I have two surgery days a week. So I'm in the operating room on Mondays and Thursdays, and in the clinic the other days. So we uh, fill in the Mondays and Thursdays, and then if we need to get overflow time, we'll cut into clinic time for that. But once I have a second orthopedist, we can also back each other up. If I'm in the clinic on a Wednesday and a fracture comes in and he's in the OR, I can tee it up and have him do it so right. it wouldn't have to wait. So uh, that way we'll have a broader range of coverage. Um, right now is the only guy I can't be on call all the time. Can't, mm -hmm. take, can't take care of all the fractures, but we're doing our best. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Um, you've mentioned doing surgeries at Fairview Range, but as I understand, uh, you might uh, eventually be doing surgeries over at the Northwood Surgery Center, the Ambulatory Surgery Center. 
Is that right? That's right. Uh, as you well know, mm -hmm. uh, the hospital is, has partnered in that uh, surgery center, and uh, it's getting set up now for for uh, outpatient procedures. And the uh, the idea would be to do orthopedic procedures there on people who live in that geographic area for whom it would be more convenient than coming to Hibbing. So that is in the that is in the works. Once I get my feet under me and, and hitting yeah. and get the, uh, the process rolling um, and the surgery center gets ready for me, that is one of our future plans. Okay, excellent. We've heard a lot um, in the community over the years um, uh, what's referred to as minimally invasive um, hip replacement or joint replacements. Um, can you speak to that a little bit and help us understand a little bit of what that is um, or and you know how that relates to your practice? Sure. In the hip, for example, the traditional hip replacement surgery was described using an incision that was about 10 to 12 inches long. Big incision. <coughs> Bigger the incision, the more muscle damage is done, mm -hmm. the better the exposure, but uh, the more collateral damage is done. And as we have become better and better at surgery over the years, we've been able to shorten the incisions. Now they're using the term minimally invasive, and different people have different ideas what's minimally invasive. Um, some people say it has to be under four inches. Um, I think it's more, you know, it really doesn't depend on how long the skin incision is as to how much soft tissue damage you do. You can make a very short incision and then really rip up the muscles underneath um, in a much longer um, pattern. So. Um, it's, it's more than just how short the incision is, it's also soft tissue technique. Mm -hmm. That being said, um, I have been uh, over the years honing my skills and on a thin person, um, the, most of my hip incisions are about four to five inches. Okay. Obese people obviously need a longer incision, so minimally invasive surgery is not for the obese. Uh, but the smaller the incision, the less soft tissue damage there is, the less pain they have after surgery, the faster they can rehabilitate, the shorter the hospital stay, and the happier the patient. Mm -hmm. So uh, minimally invasive surgery is a real thing in the, in the, uh, in the hip. In the knee, um, minimally invasive knee surgery hasn't been quite as successful. Uh, there are people doing them, and uh, um, some people are making fairly long incisions and calling it minimally invasive, but uh, um, the problem in the knee is visual, visualization. With a short incision, you just can't see in the back. Yeah. And uh, you can have complications back there if, you don't, if you're not seeing what you're doing. So I'm a little less enthusiastic about minimally invasive knee surgery. Also, the studies show that people who have had conventional knee incisions catch up to the minimally invasive patients in about two days. So wow. there's no long-term benefit in the knee, whereas there is in the hip. Hmm. So I will be doing minimally invasive hip surgery here. And uh, I think minimally invasive knee surgery needs a little more work before okay. it's ready for prime time. Okay. Well, that's really fascinating. Uh, thanks for clarifying. I think when I think about hip surgery and just a little that I know, and I think about a four-inch incision and what you do, it's, it's pretty amazing. It really is. It is. But uh, fortunately, some very bright people have thought up ways to make better and better instruments that allow us to do what we need to do. There, there was a technique where the hip replacement was done with two two-inch incisions, and you literally couldn't see. You had to do it under x-ray guidance, oh. but the dislocation rate afterwards and the malposition rate of the uh, components caused that procedure to be thrown out. Okay. So that procedure is gone, fortunately. Okay, very good. Um, I don't want you to get away without talking a little bit about um, just from the referral process so that those that listening today, you know, that might be interested or at some point, you know, have a need. Um, so mm -hmm. Um, maybe you could speak to that just a little bit as far as what sure. is necessary for the referral wise or how that works. Although at the clinic it's not mandatory that you have a referral, most insurances require a referral from a primary care provider to go see a specialist. Okay. So the majority of times the answer is yes, you will need a referral from your primary care provider. Um, okay. But um, if, you're hap if you're lucky enough to have an insurance that doesn't, then so be it. Okay. So then, then in that case, they could just simply call the, the Mississauga Clinic and make an appointment. Correct. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yep. All right. Well, excellent. Dr. Donkor, it's been a pleasure visiting with you. I have a feeling we could 
continue talking for quite a while longer, but I think uh, we're just about out of time. So I'm um, really grateful for the opportunity to visit with you and um, introduce you to the community. And uh, again, we welcome you here. It's a real pleasure to, to uh, have you part of the medical staff of Fairview Range. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure being a part of the Fairview family. And uh, this was very enjoyable. I'm surprised the time has passed so quickly. Yeah, it, it does. It does go by really quickly. Well, thank you again. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Denon Court again for joining us today at Fairview Range Focus. And uh, um, if, again, if you have any interest or the need, uh, you can make an appointment through the Fairview Masaba Clinic uh, for an appointment. So thanks for watching today. And you can uh, watch uh, next month for another uh, edition of Fairview Range Focus. Thanks for joining us. Hibbing Public Access Television would like to thank U.S. Bank for providing us with studio space.